Welcome to Biz Help For You with host Candy Messer. Entrepreneurs like to focus on the big picture, like profitability, success, and a smooth running organization. But there always seems to be those little things like taxes, employee compensation, laws, regulations, and more. Now you can get the answers you need in one place. Join us today as we break it all down for you. Now, here's your host, Candy Messer. Hello and welcome to Biz Help For You with Candy Messer. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found the information on last week's show, Selling with Authentic Persuasion, informative. If you're unable to join us and would like to listen to the show, links can be found on our YouTube and Facebook pages, as well as multiple favorite podcast platforms. If you'd like to receive notifications on when our podcasts have been uploaded, please like and subscribe. And if there are topics you'd find beneficial or questions you have, please feel free to reach out to me at media at abandp.com. Now let's learn a little bit about our guest today. Freedom is the dream of every entrepreneur. However, developing leaders and teams with an ownership mindset is the ticket to this fabled haven. Jeff Cohen, founder of Six Businesses, now presents Count Onable as the new and rapid success framework that guides CEOs to make this happen. So Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks so much, Candy. It's great to be here. Well, I always ask before I get into questions that I have for you, just to tell me a little bit more about yourself and how did you get into doing what you're currently doing? Yes, there's so many entry points I could come from for that because my life has been so rich and full. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to start out with a story I love to tell about how I became an entrepreneur. So um, I had... um, been looking at this stack of stickers. Like I got all these stickers from every sports team in the United States when I was eight years old and I had this stack, it could choke a horse. (laughs) And, you know, my eight-year-old mind said, that's the wall, I'm gonna put it up on that wall. And my mom said, no, you're not. (laughs) (laughs) So I didn't dare ask her if I could put them on the car. Um, Mm -hmm. Instead, what I did was I put them on my notebook and I went to school and suddenly my friends started saying, hey, do you have any more? Can I buy them from you? And I made 50 bucks. My dad said, Jeff, you're an entrepreneur. (laughs) And I'm like, wow, that's amazing, dad. What's that? Mm -hmm. And he explained it. And I've been living that dream ever since. And um, in my adult life, I've started six companies Mm -hmm. and it's been a really wild roller coaster of a ride. And I just want to tell you and all your listeners, like there's no question you can ask me that's off limits today. Um, there is uh, a view I have, and it's been validated by a lot of folks that like, you'll definitely learn something when I share what I've succeeded at. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You'll get a lot more out of my failures. Right. I mean, we all have, you know, those times where we fail and we're like, oh, we just really despise that almost, you know, but then when you look back and you're seeing, well, that really put me onto the path that I am now. And I wouldn't have the success I have if I hadn't had that. So I love that you said that. Well, thank you. And I just want to say that my failures really, really, really sucked. For me. <laughs> and, and for a lot of other people that were just not well treated when I was in survival mode, Mm -hmm. trying to keep my struggling business alive, um, becoming a hermit and avoiding my wife and kids and people I worked with by watching Star Trek for eight hours a day Mm -hmm. and just for an escape. And, you know, it just really sucked. I, I, you know, I started Sea level Roundtable around 2014 with the intention that no one ever experienced what I've gone through. Mm-hmm. I know that that may not be possible, but the difference I can make by sharing my journey and by helping other business owners really identify what works and what doesn't work and looking mm-hmm. at things from a perspective of what's effective versus what's ineffective mm-hmm. helps to remove some of the emotional stress that people experience as they're moving forward. Right. And it's been out of that that I developed Count Donable, which is the book I'm publishing or that's published now that um, actually gives business owners the opportunity to follow a process and a method and not be in survival mode, especially when they're going through stressful periods like high growth 
Mm -hmm. or there's tremendous risk in a business and people are very concerned. Like it makes an enormous difference to be able to actually have a playbook. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so true. Well, I know today's topic, like you said, count onable is what you are uh, putting out there now and the topic for today. So I would love for you first of all, to talk about why is accountability important? You know, why are you focusing on this aspect right now? So accountability gets a bad rap. Mm -hmm. It just does. Like, you know, you listen to the news at six o'clock at night, if you're not wise, because there's really not a lot of positive stuff in there, right? Right. And because it's negative and they talk about accountability in it, just look at what they say. Mm-hmm. Or someone that's going to jail or a politician that they don't like or something like that is someone is going to be held accountable. Mm-hmm. And listen, for a lot of people, being held accountable is kind of like being held at gunpoint. Mm-hmm. It's not a fun feeling. And so they don't have a positive viewpoint on being accountable. Right. So I'm not here to change that. Because in my mind, accountability really does require two people. Mm -hmm. It requires someone that is managing the accountability and someone that's actually doing the accountability. Mm -hmm. If you're the person doing the accountability and there's not someone that's keeping up with you on where you're at, that's going to be an issue. Right. And generally the way that's going to look is Friday at around four o'clock, right before the long holiday weekend. Your boss is going to call you up and bring up this thing you're accountable for. And the last conversation you had with them about it was a month ago Mm -hmm. and you're not expecting it. And you're in the middle of something else, or you're helping a customer and they just simply say, Hey, where's that thing you promised to deliver a month ago. Right. And you're like, Oh my God, you know, what do I say? And it backs you up. Mm -hmm. A lot of time people get defensive. My number one trigger, which um, you can read about in the very first chapter of the book, which is called Grand Theft Auto, um, that number one trigger that I developed from that experience, I've carried through with me my whole life. And I promise, if you were my boss, and I wrote about a bunch of them in the book, I apologize. Because whenever you said the word why, I became defensive. Mm -hmm. And I wasted 20 to 30 minutes of your time telling you why instead of, no, I'm committed to getting that done. I'm going to get it done. This is what my timeline is. That's those are the things you wanted to know. Right. Accountability is a really bad rap. Mm -hmm. So so why count honorable? Well, first off, I don't know about you, but if you've got a negative view of accountability, um, then what do you really take pride in? Mm -hmm. Personally, I take pride in the things I know that I have strengths in, that I'm good at, and that that I like doing. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Candy, what do you call it if you're the employee and you have a job that caters to your strengths, you're good at, and you like doing? It's not really a job, right? It's something you enjoy doing. You just get paid for it. (laughs) Right. It's your dream job. A lot mm-hmm. of people say, or it's your life's mission or whatever right. it is that, you know, it, but it's something. And, and what are the odds you're going to leave that job? Uh, very slim. Yeah. So if you're the employer that has an employee that has a job, that's catering to their strengths that they love doing and that they're good at, who would they be to you as the employer? I mean, perfect fit, right? <laughs> Yeah, they're your dream employee, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh my God, I I could not have designed this better. Mm -hmm. Um, So on the way to having a countable organization, it's all about the people, Mm -hmm. right? And there's a lot of good that comes out of having people that love their jobs, right? right? One of the things that um, comes out of it is, you have people that stay with you. But what does that mean to your business? First oh, off, it's huge, right? Yeah. You don't have to take time off to find other people, train other people, have lost productivity. Yeah. What about your customers? 
Mm -hmm. Oh, they'll be happy too. Dealing with the same person long-term. It's amazing. Right. Continuity. They develop love relationships. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine has this term called lustomers. They Mm. love you. They're your customers, but they love you. They're your biggest fans. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and the fact of the matter is that um, we don't always think about it like that. Now, Mm -hmm. As the CEO, business owner, or executive of your department, right? Right. What does it give you when your people are empowered to do their job and make decisions and please the customer? What does that give you? Freedom. (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, here's the freedom it gives you. If you someday want to take a vacation, which Mm -hmm. most of us like to do at least once a year, you probably aren't going to have to be on conference calls two to four hours a day or solving problems or dealing with fires. Right. Your family will love that. Exactly. They will love it. (laughs) You'll actually have the relationship with the family that they and you would love to have. Mm -hmm. The other thing that it does for you, and I've done some podcasts on this topic is, When you sell your business, if -hmm. you want to sell your business, at some point it may change hands, right? Right. Well, you know, if you are the most important person in your company, you're going to get shackled. Mm -hmm. I mean, really shackled to the business, probably for like five years. You're going to have an earnout. And by the way, most of those earnouts never, ever get paid. Mm -hmm. Right. So the last thing you want is a company that relies on you to grow. Right. If you are a count on company, then your business can grow with you. Mm-hmm. And more importantly, it can grow without you. Right. And that's the value a buyer is looking for. Mm-hmm. That's also the value your employees are looking for, because over time they change. And the employee whose strengths and love and and expertise are all wrapped up in a job is going to want to move forward. Right. So Count Audible gives you the tools to identify when that's starting to show up, Mm -hmm. like on a regular basis. Right. So when you say that you know, looking for these things that are starting to show up, like what would a business owner be looking for specifically that could say, up, yep, this is where I need to be going and implementing this strategy? Well, you know, first off, most businesses today have some level of dysfunctionality, Mm. some level of politics, some level of um, where there's an impact on trust, Mm -hmm. where They've identified where they want to go, but everybody else is in their Ferrari and their Porsche are driving on different freeways, going to different cities. Mm -hmm. And the CEO or the business owner or executive of the business unit is saying, I want to go to San Francisco. And, you know, one of their leaders is driving to San Diego and the other one's going to Vegas. Another one's going way up north to Seattle. And, Mm -hmm. but I promise they're going to get there really fast in those sports cars. Right. It's just, they're not going any place together and they're not communicating and they don't have uh, alignment on their team. And those are the things that are missing. Right. So when you really, really look at, um, in the book, I created um, a framework, three frameworks, actually. There's the trust framework, the alignment framework, and then ta-da, the trust alignment framework, Right. <laughs> Because the reality is, is that unless you have alignment, trust is going to fall out automatically. People mm-hmm. are, are always look, even people you've trusted and have relationship for years, they're always looking for that chink in the armor. Mm-hmm. You know, they're looking to see, oh, Jeff actually didn't do what he said he was going to do. I mm-hmm. don't know that I can trust that now. They're always looking right. for that. And because people are always looking for that, if you don't have a way of bringing trust back in Mm -hmm. weekly, daily, hourly, you don't have a way of being on the same page and identifying when the trust is slipping. Mm -hmm. 
you're going to have turnover, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of that great knowledge you have in that one employee, now you got to go spend money right. to replace that person. And hopefully, just hopefully, find someone that's good enough that a year from now will be doing the job at that same level. Right. Mm -hmm. So true. So if someone's saying, well, things are going well right now, you know, why do I have to like change up my strategy and, you know, talk about being count, count on a ball, right? You know, like things are perfect right now. Yeah. So in the introduction of the book, I very simply say, look, if your business is doing great and you're making money hand over fist and turnover is not a problem, mm -hmm. save yourself five hours and 34 minutes. <laughs> and put the book down and move on. Mm -hmm. But if you have an environment where your people are not always doing the things that align with what your goals, method, uh, your goals, your milestones, your business right. objectives all stand for, you want to read the book. Mm -hmm. the, the book is actually a process I've developed over eight years with experiences back from the early 2000s when I owned a software development company that helped Fortune 500 and Global 2000 organizations implement agile software development processes. Mm -hmm. And it actually takes some of that method and um, uh, atomically provides it in bits and bytes in the book. Every chapter is like three or four pages. You okay. pick the book up for five minutes, you got something, you can do it, you put the book down, and then you come back tomorrow and do the same thing. Right. Um, I did that because two reasons. One is I want, I'm, I'm patenting the process. Mm. Nice. And the book, the book open sources it. Mm. It says, look, even though I'm patenting this, you can implement it yourself, mm -hmm. right? Here are all of the steps. Here is what to do, how to do it, when to do it, and more importantly, what to say when you do it. Mm -hmm. Nice. And so, you know, it's it's really more than just a roadmap. It's a script. Uh, perfect. And a lot of people probably really appreciate that too, because sometimes you don't know exactly what to do, like step by step. And having that roadmap is really helpful. But what would you say to someone then who, you know, nowadays in the last couple of years, especially we've gone to many more remote employees instead of everyone being together. So how is it different if everyone is working in one building together versus being spread out, working from home and, you know, managing the staff that way? Well, you know, obviously when you're all in one place, the dynamic is a lot different. You have a lot, you have the, you know, coffee machine conversations and, you know, you see people face to face. It's a much different experience, right? Mm -hmm. And frankly, to me, it really doesn't matter. I've run both environments. Mm -hmm. um, the fact of the matter is that uh, if you're always having ad hoc conversations about things with people, and they're not necessarily expecting that conversation in the moment, it's likely you're going to trigger them. Mm -hmm. And you need to understand what triggering people does. Like, mm -hmm. you know, operating a business is a lot about psychology. If, if you want a really productive organization, then you need to understand what has people be productive or not productive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when someone comes to me, Candy, and they say, Jeff, why is this not done yet? When are you going to finally do it? Like, and right. I get defensive and I back up. And like I said, I'll waste 20 to 30 minutes of your time. Now, if you have five or six direct reports that you do that with, right. now you're wasting two to three hours a week, mm -hmm. right? Here's the worst part of it. I've left that conversation as your employee with it going on in my head. And now it's impacting my productivity for three, four, five days mm -hmm. while I'm trying to figure out, like, what had you do that? What's mm -hmm. going on? Is my job safe? Right. Like if, you, if, if you really want people to be productive, then I actually outline a meeting schedule in the book. Um, you know, 
managers, they don't want to be considered micromanagers. You know, right. nobody wants that, right? Everybody wants to be considered the one that trusts you. I trust you're going to do this. Right. Back in the 19, mid 80s, uh, Ronald Reagan was our president. And he met with Mikhail Gorbachev and signed a, the strategic arms um, agreement. And at this speech, he said, it was actually a Russian sent, uh, statement um, that he used. He said, Mikhail, we are going to trust that you are removing all of these nuclear weapons. And then we're gonna send in teams of people that will verify that they've been removed. Mm -hmm. Now, what most managers are missing is the verify process. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a defined process in the book. It's a weekly verify meeting. It doesn't have to be very long, but you have your priority actions. Right. You know who's doing those. You know those priority actions map to the milestones you have this quarter. Mm -hmm. And if someone is not taking them, there's probably a reason for it. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's not that they don't think it's important. Maybe it's something they hate doing. They're right. not good at. It's one of their weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Man, don't you want to know that right away? Wouldn't it make a difference if when you assigned it to that person, they said, listen, Candy, I'm not count honorable for that. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, like you said, you want people to be able to do what are their passions and their strengths and things. And there are going to be things in any position, theoretically, that maybe aren't you know, your ideal cup of tea and, you know, it still has to be done. But if over time there's specific tasks that have to be done over and over and over again, and someone else can actually do it, who maybe enjoys it even more, you know, if you could split that, everyone's happier, you know, it would be much easier right. for everyone, probably. It would. The issue that exists in most, not just organizations, but in most individuals is the confidence about what I am good at and what I am mm -hmm. not good at does not always exist. And the leader of those organizations, you know, say it in the book, like if you want people to trust you, you've got to trust them first. Mm -hmm. So if you want people to be vulnerable and tell you what they're not good at, you've got to be honest with them first. Right. And what happens is people are uncomfortable saying that what they're not good at and they're overly willing to take on things they hate doing or don't want to do mm -hmm. because they don't want to look bad. Right. And that wastes weeks and months. And so again, I've identified working with 300 businesses in the last eight years on this. I've identified how to actually create the environment where your employees are comfortable to tell you, hey, look, mm -hmm. you can count on me for this and this and this but I won't do the dishes. Now, worse yet is when you force them to do the dishes and then you tell them, oh, by the way, use a, use a clockwise motion. That'll clean right. them the best. And then you hold them to that clockwise motion. No one wants to be managed. Right. People hate being, you want to be a micromanager? Do that, right? Everyone will peg you. You're the micromanager. Mm -hmm. You want to empower your people? You say, look, I know doing the dishes isn't your thing. And we're looking to hire someone that does that for the next couple of weeks. Do you think you could just go at five o'clock and, you know, do that chore and I'll assign it to someone else in two weeks and, until we have someone that owns it. Right. Or that loves it. Mm -hmm. but, but most organizations, they just don't do that. And, right. you know, they experience turnover, unhappy employees, not having the trust they want to have. Um, not having the closeness and the openness in a conversation because there's right. a penalty. And let's face it, this is business. It's not hockey. Right. You don't want to take your great employee and put them in a penalty box for any time period. You mm -hmm. want them to be productive. Right. And when you've hired that A employee and you're in that last interview with them, you're about to give them the offer. And then you say, oh, by the way, and they want the job and you know they want the job, right? You say, oh, by the way, um, can you also do the dishes? <laughs> You've just made them a B employee. Mm -hmm. 
And I say that because you're hiring them as an A employee for the A job. Right. And you have no idea if that new job you're asking them to do is going to fit them. Right. And they may start disappointing you from when? Day one. And right. if they do, they're quickly going to become a B employee that looks to start leaving at some point. Mm -hmm. But then so what do you, you say to the employer? Because I, I understand what you know, you're saying, and it's in an ideal world, everyone gets to do exactly what they want, right? Um, but what happens if someone maybe doesn't have the budget to have all these multiple employees or enough work to keep, if I bring someone in to handle this task, you know, doing the dishes as you're calling it, um, but I don't have enough work to keep them, you know, throughout the week busy. Like, what do you do in that case where, you know, you've got a task that maybe isn't something they really enjoy, but you don't have enough work to have another person, or you don't have enough budget to have two people, you know, on staff at that time. It's a great question, Candy. And I would when I work with business owners that have that, and I do work with executives and business owners and entrepreneurs that have that, what they're often missing is the path to fulfilling that need. Mm -hmm. You see, in an organization, over time, as you grow, you have these new needs show up. Mm -hmm. And you do need someone that can come do them. You know, And it can't always be you. Right. So here's what I tell them. I say there are several options you have. One is you could take it on yourself. Oh, I don't have time. I hate doing that. Great. Mm -hmm. You could ask an employee that you think might like doing it and want to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. But you may not get a straight answer from them about whether or not it's something they really feel like they're qualified for or want to do. And it may go to the bottom of the list. Um, and that's fine. If you have a count honorable process implemented in your business, you're going to know every week whether or not they're actually taking that action. Mm -hmm. It's a priority to them. And if they're not, after one or two weeks, you can say, okay, great, listen, I'm going to reassign this. Mm -hmm. Or I'm going to create a job description with all the things that nobody wants to do that seem like low priorities to them. I'm going to go find someone that can fill that. Right. I picked that up in Mike McCallowitz's book, get um fix this next mm -hmm. by the way mike is an amazing author and a, just a great guy he wrote my first um uh endorsement of of count honorable and oh, I'm nice. so for that yeah um but really go find someone that is that is wanting to do that job has that skill set and loves doing it that's what i tell the business owner mm -hmm. right well, and I know right now, you know, things, people are a little bit cautious because who knows what's going to happen? Are we going to have a recession or not have a recession? So I know some people are a little bit afraid of maybe bringing on another person. So would you recommend then if they don't have enough for another person, you know, um, that maybe they just outsource that potentially to like a virtual assistant that might be able to help or, you know, so that again, you have your employee doing what they enjoy, but that task is still getting done. Absolutely, 100%. And it may also give you an opportunity to elevate someone into a managerial role, mm -hmm. right? Hey, Jeff, would you do me a favor? Could you find a virtual assistant that can do this job and manage it? And I'm going to have it on your priority action list. We're going to check in on it every week. You might actually want to have that with the person that you hire. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. What a great idea. I'll right. know whether it's being done or not. <laughs> I'm training someone for a management job. Oh, wait, what does that mean? I guess it means... I have an organization where I'm empowering my people. Right. Oh, if I'm on vacation, I still have someone managing this task. Wow. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Which is where we all want to be, right? You know, uh, I, I tell my staff too, I want to be unnecessary in my company, you know, and I'm trying to make sure clients realize that too, because sometimes clients still call and they want to talk to me and I'm like, my staff can handle things. They are empowered and they can help, you know, as well. So um, I think, you know, I think we all know that's where we need to be. Um, but I know we're running short on time. So I would love for you to share an offer that you have with our listeners. So first off, Candy, I'm so grateful to be here today. And it's such a pleasure to have this conversation with you and share it with, with your listeners. And um, so I've just launched my, my new book, Count Honorable, 
a practical guide to lift, shift, and empower you and your team. Mm -hmm. And all of the resources from the book are downloadable from countonable.com. By the way, it's spelled C O U N T O on O on O N A B L E, count on. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you can also download the first chapter of the book, Grand Theft Auto, from the website if you'd like to have a sneak peek um, and um, see what Grand Theft Auto is all about and what the trigger was that I developed. Um, also, if you're interested in having a conversation, um, you can make a request there or book some time on my calendar or someone on my teams. And we will absolutely um, be listening for your greatness and what you want to create with your business mm -hmm. and see if you'd like to implement Count Honorable. We have a few ways you can do it, certainly on your own. And then we have um, some groups that we're um, providing where people can support each other. Uh, we have some mentoring that we can help you with, or if you'd like one-on-one -on -one where we're actually working directly with you and your company, we're happy to have a conversation about what that looks like as well. Nice. And if anyone wants to find you, touch base with you, why don't you give all of the ways that they can find you and reach out? So I have a presence on LinkedIn. Um, I will say this, this is really important. There's about 2 million Jeff Cohens in the world. <laughs> Okay. Just saying. So it's likely if you just do a search for Jeff Cohen, you may not see me right away. So you're probably going to want to do a search for Count Honorable. Mm -hmm. I will definitely come up. I, I found that before I started using the term, it had only been used six times. At least that's all I found on the internet. So I will come up and I do own the URL and I am very interested in developing a relationship with you and your audience and helping any way that I can. So I'm on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Uh, we're working on the YouTube channel and I'm findable. Perfect. We'll also have information in the show notes too. So anything that's been provided to us, we will put there. So be sure to find those links um, so you can easily connect with Jeff. Uh, but thank you, Jeff, so much for being a guest on my show and sharing your, your, your experience on this topic. I know it's been very informative. Well, thank you so much, Candy. I'm really grateful for the opportunity and I can't wait to hear from your listeners. Great. And I do want to thank the listeners. So for your taking the time out and listening to this podcast, thank you so much. I hope you had answers to some of your questions on this topic, count onable accountability that works. If you have any additional questions or comments, be sure to reach out to Jeff at any of the links um, that we will have for you in the show notes. You can send us a message as well at abnp.com or media at abnp.com. And would you please share our show information with those you know? I'd greatly appreciate your support. I hope you can join us for next week's topic, how to turn your customers into mini advocates. And please remember you can connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And my website is abnp.com. You can also find the podcast posted on multiple favorite podcast platforms, including Google, Tune in Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. Until next time, have a great week. Thank you for listening to Biz Help for You. Please join your host, Candy Messer, again next time. Have a terrific day.